Next up, we have Christy Algar, a mother of three living in rural Tasmania. Currently, she is working on the committees of Animal Liberation Tasmania and Tasmanian Animal Save. So please give a very warm round of applause for Christy Algar. Hello, hello, hello. Back here again. Um, first of all, I'd just like to acknowledge that we are gathered here on the lands of the Kwana people, that these lands were never ceded, sovereignty never ceded, and I'd like to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to apologise uh, right now if I seem a little distracted or lose my train of thought a little bit, because something happened a couple of hours ago it's kind of left me a little bit rattled. You see, I got some news from back home in Hobart. This time of year, we have the Royal Hobart Show. It's a big agricultural show. And on Thursday, I was there documenting the animals on display being exploited. Flew out here on Friday, and apparently Friday night they held a rodeo. And I've uh, just watched footage from back home of a bull that was sent into the arena and he broke his leg, clean off at the joint. And so that's left me really, really sort of a little bit strong. And instead of being able to focus on communicating with all you beautiful people, I've kind of been focusing on sending off emails, doing media releases, all of these sorts of things. Which kind of brings me to what I wanted to talk to you about today, which is what becoming an animal rights activist has done to my life personally. And I wish I'd had somebody who had given me advice at the beginning and been brutally honest with me at the beginning, kind of the way I'm going to be with you now. You see, it's been a literal descent into chaos. I'm a soccer mum, like literally I'm a soccer mum. I drive a Turak tractor, take my kids to soccer, stay at home mum, do the lunches, it's all very mundane. But there is this constant tornado going on around me. You never know when the next uh, big scandal, big issue, big expose is going to come out and you've got to be prepared on the ground and ready to go from the get-go. And I wish when I'd become an animal rights activist all those years ago, someone had sat me down and said, Okay, this is the path you're going to go down. You've got to put strategies in place now. If you want this to be sustainable, ongoing and safe for you, you need to immediately now have the strategies worked out. Instead, it's been leaping from crisis to crisis, chaos to chaos, multiple burnouts. This morning at a panel, the breakfast panel, I touched briefly on how within a year of getting involved in activism through Rabbit Rescue, I actually started investigating. And the very first thing I did was did an on-the-ground undercover investigation into a rabbit farm back home in Tasmania with a hidden camera. Put on a big persona of somebody who was wanting to become a rabbit farmer so that I could get footage from this facility work out what they did, their, um, their schedules, capture the footage, take it to the authorities. And unfortunately, it didn't really pan out the way I really wanted it to. You see, I assumed that once I took that footage of these rabbits who were being abused in the most abhorrent ways, I thought I could take that to the authorities, the RSPCA, to the government, and they'd do something about it. That was when I learnt that you can't trust those, those structures currently because nothing was done, because everything I documented and brought to the authorities was legal. It was above board. My faith in the system was irrevocably broken in that exact moment. And with each expose that I've assisted with, sharing to the world through my work with Animal Liberation Tasmania and with Tasmanian Animal Save, I am growing ever more discontent with the way society and the government is structured. The systems we live in are not designed 
to protect or advocate for the most vulnerable in our uh, communities. They are designed to hide what is happening in those communities. And this includes very much so non-human animals. And I still struggle to, to accept that this is okay. I struggle to accept that this is just the way it has to be but because we know that it doesn't have to be this way. I think this festival alone stands testament to the fact that we can create something better, something so much more beneficial for everybody who lives in this world, humans and non-humans alike, no matter who we are, no matter who we are. And it really has been a, a, a progression of not just my personal views regarding non-human animals, but also regarding people in the broader society. I've actually shifted further left. I have actually effectively become more radicalised in a lot of my views regarding humans and non-humans through becoming vegan, getting involved in rescue and becoming an animal rights activist. But it has its pitfalls because when you start within activism, you're breaking a bit of a social model that we are all conditioned to accept that it's okay to have certain opinions, but you're not allowed to act on those opinions. You're not allowed to try and affect change. Your opinions aren't supposed to change the status quo. And becoming an activist, that's exactly what you're trying to do. You are trying to change the status quo. You are trying to create friction in society that sparks a fire that can burn away all the negative and then regenerate new growth. I had no idea the amount of pushback that activists received. And I just wish someone at the very beginning had said, be prepared. Be prepared for the negative. Be prepared for the hate. I wish someone had said, you are going to come up against individuals and systems that are going to try and break you. And I'll readily accept that sometimes those individuals and those systems have broken me. So I would encourage anybody here today who is considering becoming more engaged in animal rights activism, start your strategies now to build resilience. Connect with people in the community who value you as an individual and will provide you with the safety networks that you need. The person next to you is as strong as you are going to be. The person who respects you and loves you and wants to support you. That is how we build a community that is sustainable and resilient because we see a lot of traumatic things that will rattle us even in the most beautiful and serene environments. I also wish somebody had said to me that there will also be the people who will daily tell you how amazing you are. And it happens. You do one little thing and they're like, you're incredible. I don't know how you do it. You're amazing. And when you're sort of trapped in a bit of an echo chamber sometimes, it gets up into your head. And ego can start to take hold. We all need a bit of ego when we're an activist. That is a part of resilience. But sometimes it can take control over who we are. And we then refuse to allow ourselves to be held accountable when we do make mistakes. And we all make mistakes. We are all fallible. So in order to beat that, I think once again it comes back to creating bonds of community amongst one another so that we can talk with one another and critique one another and accept those critiques with love and understanding and progress, therefore, to be better. And my epiphany moment happened on New Year's Eve. I was at the Falls Festival down in Tasmania and we were doing three days of outreach with Animal Liberation Tasmania. It's a great festival for outreaching. People are open to new experiences, new ideas. And 
my friend and I, who were outreaching together, we had actually been at a slaughterhouse occupation at the Lover Duck Slaughterhouse in Nil together. And here we were at Falls Festival. We had had a lot to drink. And we started to talk about what we had seen and experienced at Lover Duck and realised the negative impact it had had on us as individuals. And we cried. And there was snot. And there was snot, you know, sobbing. There might have been a little bit of vomit. It was a pretty intense moment. But the saving grace of that moment was the fact that we had friends who hadn't been at this slaughterhouse or indeed had not been involved in lock-ons or shutdowns in any way. But these friends of mine are brutally honest individuals. And they said to us that sometimes the way we communicated what happened at that slaughterhouse made them uncomfortable. And it made them uncomfortable because a lot of our sentences began with we, us, I, the activists. And some of the photos that were shared centred we, us, I, the activists. And this made them uncomfortable because it was drawing attention away from the 22,000 ducks that were on that slaughterhouse floor. So since then, for the past however months it's been, 10 months or so, I've been working very hard after that breakdown to rebuild and to create strategies and better understanding of myself and reconnect with myself so that when I advocate for non-human animals, I do it in a way that focuses on their experience, their oppressions, not ours. And so I guess there's two things that I'd really like to tell you people. And it's going to sound a little bit contradictory. So bear with me. First of all, we are all ordinary. There is nothing about us that is particularly unique or special or makes us better than the person next to us. There's about seven and a half billion people in this world. Nothing we say or do or write or sing or express hasn't been done before. And so we need to learn from the people who have gone before us and the way they have experienced activism in the world or indeed just life in this world. And when we acknowledge that we are indeed ordinary human beings, I'm a, mun a mundane stay-at-home mum who spends most of her time on the couch covered in cookie crumbs on the internet. That's the majority of my life. When we acknowledge that, it enables us to stay focused and humble. The second piece of advice is that every one of you is extraordinary. And I told you it was going to be contradictory, but you are all extraordinary individuals. And what makes you extraordinary is that in a society that is so habituated to oppression of humans and non-humans, you broke out of the mould. For whatever reason, whatever the stimulus was that brought you to this point, you broke out of that mould. And it is a very rare thing indeed to see amongst humans that we will challenge ourselves to the extent that the mould is broken and the status quo that we once supported starts getting chipped away. So never deny to yourself that you are extraordinary because you are and you are affecting beautiful change in this world. Change in many different ways, whether it's through music or art or poetry, social media posting, holding signs, or locking yourself to a kill floor. It is beautiful and extraordinary and should be embraced. But never forget that you are part of something far larger in this world, and please remember, to stay humble for yourself and for others. Thank you. I think I might have gone a bit quickly. I've got a habit of doing that when I've had too much coffee. If anybody has any questions, you're more than welcome to ask them um, or I'll be hanging around over in this corner here if you want to come speak to me later. Thank you.
I think they're going to try and get a mic out to the crowd for anybody who might want to do the thing. So, yeah, there's a mic now live. Um, any questions at all or statements or reflections or feedback? Go for broke. Cool. Does that mean it's gin time? I think that means it's gin time, doesn't it? It's gin time. <laughs> Again, thank you. <laughs>